life. Thankful we can open the Word of God. We come upon Sermon 52 and our journey through Genesis back to the beginning. That's what we are calling this series. Thankful to Luke Warg for running with the rest of Genesis 28 two weeks ago in my place. And I'm thankful for that, his work in the text, and I hope and pray it was encouraging to you, as I know uh, we were blessed by it, just talking about it some, and I know he got a blessing from studying it. I'm encouraged that God is raising up other capable men to teach and preach among Emmanuel Baptist Church. That is a good sign of health and strength in a church, as people are discipled and grow in the Lord, and I'm thankful for brothers in Christ who are seeking to follow Jesus Uh, faithfully and willing to teach the Bible. That's a blessing. Well, we come upon one of the sweetest and most exciting periods of Jacob's life because from this point on, his life is going to be marked by chaos and some pretty rough things. Um, But this season right here, this window, can is probably one of the most exciting periods of his life. Uh, which obviously was began when uh, or began with him when God met with him at the end of Genesis 28, and we know that Jacob's life had been interesting so far. I mean, he fought the battles of sibling rivalry for years, and he was a deceptive younger brother and a son, and his family was full of conflict and chaos, and yet God was unfolding His plan in their lives through all of that. And it's amazing, isn't it? And God was blessing Jacob's parents and he was blessing Jacob in spite of Isaac, Rebekah, and Jacob and Esau. And Jacob started Genesis 28 on the run from his brother Esau who wanted to kill him. And he ended Genesis 28 hearing incredible promises from the mouth of the Lord God of his fathers. So let's see how the narrative picks up in Genesis 29. If you look at verse 1 with me, it says, Then Jacob went on his journey. Now, I want to say about that word went, um, uh, linguist, linguistic scholars would say that that word literally means he picked up his feet. He was going, all right? So you picture a, a rush of energy, which no wonder who did he just meet with at the end of Genesis 28, okay? God, right, if you're wondering, all right? So he went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked and behold a well in the field. And lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. And a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And sometimes those stones... Uh, they would use a stone as like a cover so someone wouldn't fall in the well or a sheep wouldn't fall in the well. And sometimes those stones would have a hole in the middle of them where they drop down a bucket and they could draw water that way. Um, but it says in verse 3, Thither were all the flocks gathered. The, all the flocks were gathered to the well. And they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. So that's, he, that's explaining what they would typically do with that well in that place. So Jacob comes, he sees the well, he sees the flocks around the well, and he sees the shepherds there. Verse 4, Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye, or where are you from? And they said, Of Haran are we. Now, is there any significance about Haran? Yes, that is where Jacob's mother was from. Who remembers that? She sent him to Haran. That's his destination, okay? And so that's great news. And so he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. In fact, behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. Now, if that shouldn't ring any bells either, because it's not just his mother sent him to Haran, to Laban, her brother, but his father Isaac sent him there to find something. A wife. So do you know Laban? Yes, we know Laban. In fact, his daughter's coming. This is interesting. And Jacob said, he, he comments on their activity there by the well. He says, lo, it is yet high day. Neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. 
water ye the sheep and go and feed them. In other words, why are you guys gathered around the well? Why don't you water these guys and get them out to pasture where they belong? It's not time to be here. And they said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Typically, it took three or four men to move this stone together, unless, you know, you wanted to hurt yourself uh, trying to move it, and they would wait till everybody came. And so verse 9, while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and he got out his muscles and rolled up his sleeves. And he rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. And Jacob kissed Rachel. Now, mind you, she's never met this guy before. <laughs> and he kissed her and he lifted up his voice and he wept. So he kissed her. And now he's crying, you know. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's brother. In other words, I'm related to your dad and that he was Rebekah's son. And so then she ran and told her father. And it came to pass when Laban heard the tidings of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him. Now, if you're thinking, I just want to stimulate your thought about Genesis. Recall in your mind Genesis 24 when the servant of God met Rebekah. And Rebecca ran home, and then Laban ran. A lot of this seems familiar. The narrator does that on purpose. Okay, it should feel similar. Should feel familiar. Okay, so Laban ran and embraced Jacob, and he kissed Jacob, and he brought him to his house. And he, Jacob, he told Laban all these things. Told him why he was there, what was going on. And Laban said to him, Surely thou art my bone and my flesh. And so Jacob abode with him the space of a month. So our title tonight is A Bounce in Your Step. A Bounce in Your Step. Do you feel that tonight? Are you encouraged? I got an encouraging text mex text mech, text that's text mex is like, you know, it wasn't that. It was a text message from a brother this morning. And that it, I'm thankful for encouraging times and things that put a bounce in our step. Are you excited tonight? Or are you rushing forward into a new adventure? I mean, shouldn't it journeying in the will of God and toward the will of God for your life, shouldn't it be exciting? Shouldn't it, the adventure of following Jesus to the kingdom of heaven be a rush? I mean, you're only going to live forever. And as Jesus empowers you to do his will in this life, the rewards are only mind-bogglingly great when you choose to obey Jesus. Jacob had a bounce in his step as he arrived in Haran. And then Rachel ran. And Laban ran. I mean, there's lots of excitement going around. It sounds familiar. So let's take a look at why you can journey toward God's will with a bounce in your step. And why Emmanuel Baptist Church, uh, why we can journey toward heaven with a bounce in our step. I have some of Jack's uh, or the kids' mega blocks with me tonight because I was reminded in, prepara pre pre in the preparation of this um, about a video that we have of Jack sitting on the floor playing with blocks and he's just do, 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 do. you know he's making noise and he's building this little palace thing and then he he leaves them there sitting there on the on the floor and then he kind of just goes over there's a basket over here with more of the blocks and he's reaching there and he's looking he's kind of standing and, and the whole time do, 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 you know and then he's coming back over and he's skipping back over and he's just sitting there and he's just happy and do, just random I mean just at, I, I'll show it to you later in fact some of the sounds he made, Elizabeth and him will laugh about it today, though. She'll just look at him and go, yeah, you know, like that, one of those things. And he has a bounce in his step, at least in that video. Now, Jack is our child who's most like his father at five, wild, okay? Um, he is strong, he is strong-willed, and he is fiery. Jack can be manipulative and deceitful, all right? He'll blow up at the drop of the hat, and he'll drop the hat, all right? And that, that was me as a kid, just FYI. But in spite of those struggles, he's a happy kid. 
And I've noticed he's happier when I'm being the dad I should be. I have noticed that. And it shows up that a, the happiness shows up on occasions uh, like the video. Jack typically has a bounce in his step in spite of his imperfect father. His mother is perfect, but in spite of his perfect, imperfect father and in spite of Jack's imperfections, he's a young boy with a bounce in his step. Well, maybe you are a young Christian or maybe you can identify with spiritual immaturity in your life. Uh, maybe you've picked up some bad traits from parents or others that have been around you in life. Or maybe you have your own traits that God needs to change. Maybe you have a past with problems uh, with others like Jacob had. But that being said, you are grateful for God's goodness in your life. And in spite of your struggles, you are more happy now than you have ever been, especially than you ever were when you didn't know God personally, especially before you ever uh, had heard God's voice. Remember, Jacob's in a period of life where he is personally heard from God for the first time, and there's a lot of joy, and there's a lot of happiness that comes when this book comes alive in the life of a believer, and you hear from God, it's amazing, and, and so you're a happy child of God. Now, and God is always the father he claims to be. So we can always be happy, 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 as a wise duck commander sage would say. In spite of your imperfections or the imperfections of others, you understand what it means to have a bounce in your step because of the Lord. And that's the whole point tonight. Being a child of God, being a follower of Jesus Christ, journeying toward God's will in this life, journeying towards God's ultimate will for eternity that is a joyful thing, that is a thing that gives strength, that is a thing full of love. You can have a bounce in your step. And as a Christian, surely you can recall times, like if, like if you're not feeling this tonight, you can recall times in which you have felt this way. And you're thinking, man, I'd like to feel this way tomorrow. And I, I just want to say, you should have a bounce in your step, brother, sister. I should. We should. I know life's hard. I know there are difficult things. I know there's frustrating things. And I know we mess up. But you and I and we can journey toward God's will with a bounce in our step. So Jacob finally reached a period of his life in which he had that. Now, think about how he had been walking, okay? We're talking about his bounce his actions he was deceptive before so can you picture a sly walk you know for a deceptive person you know i want to picture pink panther picture someone a little more sly and cunning and deceitful you just picture the you know the jacob the cunning one and then jacob was on the run so picture a a, a rush and a run of pure haste and and angst because i'm gonna die if i don't get out of here you think about his parents who created problems for him by their decisions. And you think about how he created problems for himself by his decisions. And then Genesis 28 began with him or with his dad sending Jacob to the house of Bethuel, his mother's father. Go back to Genesis 28. I want you to see that. It says Isaac called Jacob and he blessed Jacob. And he charged Jacob. In other words, he gave him a command. He, he said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. This is very reminiscent about Abraham sending his servant to go get a wife of the daughters of his homeland for Isaac so that the blessings of God promised to Abraham would be passed on to Isaac, would be passed on to his children once he has children with a wife. And that those blessings need to continue with Jacob. And so Isaac says, don't take a wife of Canaan. Verse 2, arise, go to Padan Aram to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Now, why is that significant? Well, Genesis 24, Abraham, we see that. We see here that Isaac was finally on board with God's ways and what God was doing in his life, even in his old age. That was evident by verses 3 and 4, how he said, God Almighty bless thee, son. And make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee. That thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. 
So Jacob was on the run. He was scared for his life. And yet he was right on the run where he needed to be. I mean, even when you make a mess in life, even when you have messed others over, God is working in your life as a child of God. And even when you're running from situations that have blown up and you contributed to that, you're, you may be on the run from God, but you're going to run right into God if he's your father. And he sees you, he knows you, and that's who Jacob ran into. And in an incredible, merciful form, God met with Jacob. In an amazing fashion, he affirmed the promises of Abraham to Jacob. What? To Jacob? He promised him, you get the land of Canaan, right? He promised him, you're going to have an innumerable seed that you'll never be able to count. He promised him that in his seed, all families would be blessed. But then he also added a personal note. Look at 28.15. He said, behold, look at this, Jacob. I am with thee. <laughs> I am will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. Jacob, I'm not going to leave you until I've done what I have spoken to thee of. So here was Jacob. He's on the run, but now he has the promises of God, and he's learning to fear God, and he's learning to worship God, and he's vowing to serve God and give offerings to God. Jacob was greatly impacted by his meeting with God. This forever changed his life. Now, God, God had some come-to-Jesus meetings, if I could use that terminology. God had some meetings planned for Jacob in which Jacob was going to see himself for who he was and see God for who he was. That was to come. But this was the very first time Jacob was ever confronted with the living God, and it was a confrontation of grace. He was on, he was a mess, he was on the run, yet God was with him in spite of him. And it really feels like he had a bounce in his step. And why did he have this bounce in his step? And why was this such an exciting period of his life? I want you to notice and, and just picture this. I'm going to come down here. I, I want you to picture Jacob coming and he's arriving into the land. And, and because of what God did in his heart, as he's leaving that place, Bethel, the house of God, where he met with God, he has joy and he has energy in his life. And just imagine, just speculate just for a second about your own life. That when you gather here with the people of God on a Wednesday night or on a Sunday morning or whenever it is, or maybe it's a Bible study with the men or the ladies, and the Word of God just does something in your heart that you didn't necessarily expect. And God speaks to you and it gives you a new energy as you begin your journey. And God is doing something in your life. Listen, you may not know how all the details are going to work out in front of you. Jacob had no idea. He just kind of knew a general direction of life. And you may not know that, but here was Jacob, and he's got this new energy, and he's going, and he looks here, and there's this well, and there's three flocks of sheep around it, verse 2 says. And so he goes up to the shepherds in verse 4, and he says, oh, where are you guys from? And they say, Haran. And he says, do you know Laban? And they say, yes, we know Laban. And in fact, look over there, his, his daughter Rachel happens to be coming up right now. I mean, is anyone else seeing this? I just want you to feel this and feel how Jacob felt. He left his homeland on the run from an angry brother who wanted to kill him. On the run from his past and from the problems his parents caused and the problems he caused. He has met with God. God has promised him the blessings of Abraham. He doesn't know how all this is going to work out. He has nothing to his name. And yet, here he comes and he happens. He happens to run into these shepherds. They happen to be from Haran. They happen to know Laban. And oh, look, look, there's Rachel. Imagine how he felt. And so he has this strange interaction and with them in verses 7 and 8. You know, he's, he's like, hey, why are you guys out here? This is, it's not time to gather them in and water them. Why don't you water them real quick and, and get them out? He's kind of lost his, he's kind of lost his, his uh, sheepishness, you know. You just picture Esau and Jacob back in the day, and Esau's really the bold one, and give me what I deserve, and blah, blah, blah. And Jacob's kind of like the, he's the, he's over there by the stove cooking the beans, you know, plotting and scheming and a little sheepish, and, and you get, kind of get that sense. But now he's basically asking these, telling these guys, listen, I know how to shepherd, let me tell you how it's done. You kind of get that. He's got this new sense of boldness, which serves to the point that when an immature believer is suddenly emboldened, by hearing from God, sometimes they think they know it all. That can happen. 
that happens. Boldness is great. And when someone like Jacob has met with God and God has changed their life and suddenly they have this new confidence, that's great. But sometimes they can act real interesting with others. And so that's what Jacob did. And so they explained why, hey, we're not going to move this thing. This takes more than two people, more than three people to move this stone. And we're waiting for all the flocks. And so as, as they're talking, here comes Rachel and she's bringing her flock up to the well. And Jacob just, I mean, he, you know, he's like, well, I can do this. And he's moving the stone. He's just moving it out of the way. He has this newfound strength. This is not the Jacob who was selling who is selling beans for birthright. This is a new Jacob. Something has changed in his life and he's got a lot of motivation and he's got a lot of excitement and so he sees Rachel, he knows that's Laban's daughter and I have a future with God through that man and possibly through this girl. And he moves that stone and then he grabs Rachel and she's like, what are you doing? And she, he kisses her. And he's crying. And he's just overwhelmed with emotion. I mean, Matt, just think about this. He's on the run. He's on the run from all his problems. He's on the run from all his heartaches. He's on the run from all these things. And suddenly he has this random interaction with God who has promised him these things. And now here he is where he's supposed to be, meeting who he's supposed to meet. You'd probably cry too. You'd probably be overwhelmed with emotion that you are exactly where you need to be for God's will to be done. You ever, you ever feel this way? When you're just setting out on a journey to follow God and it's like, you, you may not always realize it in the moment, but looking your back, you're like, oh my word, God was there and God was there and God was there in spite of my imperfections, in spite of my youthful energy and zeal that had no knowledge, God was there in the midst of it and he was doing exactly what he wanted to do. And so Jacob told Rachel who he was and she ran to Laban and Laban came and he took him to his house and there Jacob told him all about what was going on in his life and, and all, all that had transpired and all that he anticipated God would do. And Jacob said, hey, welcome home, more or less. Your family here. And he stayed with him a month. And we'll have to see what happens after that because, you know, there's going to be some things that Jacob's going to have to learn that you reap what you sow. Before I, before I get to the heart of this, I, I, I want you to compare this with Abraham's servant who, when he went to find a wife and he came to Haran for Abraham, how dependent upon God he was in prayer. And show me God. And then Rebekah came. We don't find Jacob praying like that. We don't find Jacob depending upon God in the same way. In fact, we find Jacob acting more like Isaac when Isaac was depending upon the things he could see or really not see, touch, taste, feel. Jacob had picked up on, he, he was a new man and God was doing something in his life. But what Jacob had not let go of yet was his reliance and his dependence upon his senses. And I'm just telling you what we're going to find out. Even though it was exciting to see Rachel and the potential that that afforded, we are going to find out that he would reap what he sowed. And things are not always as they seem. You'll have to come back next week to find out that. But what's the point of all this, this excitement? Why was Jacob so excited? See, Jacob arrived in the land of Haran with a bounce in his step because God was with him on the journey. Just like God said. Just like he said, I'll be with you wherever you go. And I'm not gonna be done with you until I have done all I have said I would do. God promised him the land of Canaan. God promised him a seed. He wasn't married yet. Now he's like seeing the right, or potentially, the right lady to marry and blessing. And I mean, this is mind boggling. I mean, Jacob wasn't perfect, but God was providential. And in your life, you're not perfect. And you don't know what's coming down the pike. 
You know you need to obey Jesus. And you know you need to love his church. And you know you need to do his mission. And you're not perfect and you're going to make mistakes. But you know God is providential and he's working things out for your good and for his glory. And not just that. I mean, think about how even in his family plans, his family was a mess. And Rebecca sent him away to her brother so that so that uh, he wouldn't be... So Jacob wouldn't be killed by Esau. Even Rebecca, with all her shortcomings and failures, her, and all her fears, God worked out her plan. And here's Isaac, who has finally come to his spiritual senses, and has finally sent the son that God chose to get a wife in the way God chose, and God's working out Isaac's plans when they're spiritual plans. God is working these things out. And we'll have to wait and see again about what comes. But I want you to think about yourself. Okay? I have one page of notes here. If you're feeling like you're an immature believer, you can journey toward God's will with a bounce in your step because God is with you. You can do it. His will for your life is to grow in his grace. That's his will. You're headed in a certain direction. God wants you to know Jesus richly through life. He wants you to love his people, his church genuinely. And he wants you to obey Jesus' commands faithfully and diligently. And as you journey toward heaven, Listen, God can give you something in your life. He is working in you in spite of you to bring about his plan. And God wants to bless you. And he wants to bless others through you. So I want to encourage each and every one of us tonight to just put a smile on our face. Because as much of a mess Jacob was in and as much of a mess he was about to experience Because you do reap what you sow. God was in his life. And you know the big picture of Genesis. Is that God was working with these messed up people. To fulfill his promises. To put a people in a land. And one day bring a Messiah through them to the world. Who would never mess up. Who would always be faithful who would rescue us in our sin and show us grace and mercy and give us joy unspeakable and full of glory and faith and love in him. The whole story of the Bible is you mess up and you can't do it. But there is a God who loves you and who is doing his work in your life in spite of you. And you know what that ought to do to you? Put a bounce in your step.